This is Tuna on Toast. Abigail, how are you doing? Great. How are you? I'm good. The first time you and your bandmates played in L.A., you were at the radio station I work at. We had like a six minute quick chat and then I got to see your first show. And it was really fun. What did you think of that venue? And I'm just going to get right into it because I have so many memories of that show, that particular show. It was packed. It was sold out. But your show at the El Rey in front of an audience, which I don't know if you knew what to expect that night. No, not at all. I mean, it was our first time. This was the one in, in November, right? Yes. No, just, well, it was our first time in America at all. So none of us knew what to expect because, you know, it's one thing to be a band in the UK and then for our music to reach Europe. That's kind of like one exciting thing. And then for it to go to reach America that soon was just like such a shock. And I think also just LA, especially because not to, not that any other, you know, place in America is not as good, but I think, you know, LA holds a lot of prestige in the British imagination because it's just the, you know, when you're over here, it seems to be the kind of one of the the largest cultural hubs, kind of a mythological, unreal place. And so playing there and playing to fans was like so cool. Did you feel like you had reached some sort of personal goal or band goal just based on that night, November of 2023 is when that went down? Well, I don't know, because I feel like when you say a goal, it makes it sound like a finite thing like okay we're done now it kind of just felt it felt not to be cheesy it felt more like okay this is now the start of like yeah. some, this is something opening kind of to us that we didn't expect I mean yeah it was a huge like achievement I think for us to, to do that but it, rather than kind of fulfilling a goal it was more kind of being like oh okay we're we're allowed to do this and this is you know where we're going one of the cool things from my perspective specifically that night when i saw you play for the first time because yes i have heard your songs and maybe i have seen a video of yours and the bands and i just felt this passion creativity and like unity that you created for the audience because you all had it on stage and i walked away feeling so uplifted that night oh that makes me really happy i mean yeah so did we I'm glad that, that comes across. For sure does. What city did you grow up in? Where exactly? I was born in London, but when I was very young, I, my parents moved to kind of out out in the middle of nowhere. And then I went to school, like a boarding school, kind of out, out in the English countryside. And then I moved back to London for uni. When you were growing up in the area that you grew up, were you 100% into the arts? Did you like sports? What sort of things were you into? I mean, I, I I enjoyed sports. I did. I wasn't, you know, completely averse to some, you know, uh, team sports, but I like art was kind of always what I was going to do. And I think I knew from really young that this was what I wanted to do uh, as a career. So I'm very lucky to have actually done it. What do you think it is about you when you were out there and you started the band that, I mean, you really have the eye of the tiger than the focus on this to not get distracted because it seems like you guys are not distracted. It's funny, that kind of thing, because we did and we do work very hard and we were focused. But the thing is, it was not that we were distracted, is that we were very fortunate and that we didn't have to, you know, work two jobs to make rent or, you know, have to cancel a gig or a rehearsal because we had to pick up a shift you know we were lucky enough we all you know were working or at uni or kind of had you know things that we were doing but we were in the very privileged position where we had time to rehearse a lot and go to the gigs when we got them and do that and so um i think it's really really hard i don't know if it's i guess i assume it's the same in the states but here in, in the uk it's, it's really hard to start a band I think being solo is one thing because you only have one person you you know you're responsible for but starting a band I think is really really hard and it's kind of a, a daunting task uh, because of you know the crisis of of funding for the arts over here. So I think you know we we got very lucky uh, as well as you know working really hard and not giving up and you know trying and working at it but it you know it it is owed a lot to having the time and the financial stability to be able to do that. Who are some artists or groups or bands before you became in the position you're in now with your group that you would see play on TV or YouTube or in person, wherever, and you thought, oh, that's that's pretty good. I relate to that person and potentially I think maybe I could do that. I'm not saying that you, in your own head, you were like, oh, I'm better than them, but just you felt <laughs> inspired. Like, wow, look at, look at them go right there. I can do this. I think the first person that comes to mind is someone who's now a friend of mine. Uh, called Lucia 
Uh, she has a band. I don't know if you know them. They're called Lucia and the Best Boys. Yes. And, you know, they're based in Glasgow. And I, when I was starting the last dinner party and when I was just kind of playing on my own, I played a couple shows with them because they needed someone to come and play synth. And I remember watching her and seeing them before I played with them and then watching her while I was on stage with her and all of them, but just speaking as a front woman, watching another front woman, she was really kind of instrumental in me looking at someone who's, you know, same age as me, similar kind of genre, how she was on stage and how magnetic and brilliant and exciting and how she engaged with the fans and, you know, how she dealt with if the crowd wasn't super hype, you know, still giving it your all and still kind of, you know, engaging really beautifully. And now they're coming on tour with us, which is really cool. But yeah, I think she was one of the first people that I met and that it was a was a contemporary a, you know someone that was in my circle that I knew that was doing that and was so brilliant rather than watching a celebrity or someone you don't know and thinking oh that's so kind of out of reach I think she was really inspiring to me as a as a front woman did you ever have any lessons in terms of not that you need it but singing or any instruments in your life yeah I'm I, I have a really I have a wonderful vocal coach shout out shout out Lorna <laughs> um I did have piano lessons when I was a kid but I gave up <laughs> so I just kind of had to relearn on my own having yeah because I kind of was winging it for the first like year and a bit in terms of singing and then I was suddenly like oh shit like I actually could probably train mm. um and that's really helped I think what was it like for you to go from being in your bedroom and maybe singing and writing your own thoughts down to like all of a sudden, holy cow, uh, I'm going to stand in front of people and I'll deliver it to strangers. Was there any ever anxiety or was it all confidence? How did it go for you? I've been doing that since I was 13. Like that's when I started writing and performing like at school or whatever. But I've always had really bad stage fright and now it's got kind of it's it's lessened now especially when you're on a tour because you do the same thing every night and it becomes routine and you get less scared but yeah i'd get i'd get really bad stage fright you know right before you know i like i remember doing like a school talent show or something and i actually like i think i threw up from <laughs> from nerves oh. but it was always as soon as you know i got on and we kind of start then it goes away and it's more manageable now in a i'm in a much smaller bubble than you but before I do any of my stuff, whether it's something like this on a Zoom or on camera and live stage, my stomach <laughs> turns so bad. I feel so lightheaded. And then I say, how am I supposed to go do this right now? There's no way I can do it. And then you go out there and 10 seconds in, I forgot that I was even feeling all those oh. nerves before. Yeah. I got to ask, what is the what is the meaning of tuna, tuna on toast? Is that like a pun on, on tune? Like music? What, what's the backstory? Okay, the backstory on Tuna on Toast is, have you ever heard of the TV series Seinfeld? Yeah. There was an episode where one of the characters starts doing the opposite in his life because everything when he does it normally turns out uh, terrible. So he's like, I'm going to do the opposite. His normal sandwich that he ate was Tuna on Toast and everything went bad. So I just, I kind of like how it sounded and I'm like, well, hopefully mine, this won't go bad. Uh, hopefully it'll be actually good for me. And that's how I got the name. Okay, love. I mean, I, the great <laughs> fan of Juno Post. <laughs> um, can you take me through a little bit of a timeline just so we can lay it out for everybody? We're sitting here, obviously, in 2024, Prelude to Ecstasy. You got the acoustics and the covers coming out fairly soon. But in 2020, like pandemic year, was the last dinner party a group? Yeah, so oh, it's hard to remember now because like the pandemic feels like such a such mind fog. So I was I started writing the songs that would be the start of what's on the album and what we play. Like I think like Burn Alive and Mirror, those were all kind of being written when I was 18, 19. And then I met Lizzie and Georgia at uni. I was writing these songs at the same time and we just thought, why don't, why not start a band? So that was kind of end of 2019 into 2020. And then I asked my friend who was at music school, who's the best guitarist, you know? And he was like, Emily Roberts. So I asked her and then she brought along Aurora because they had worked on a project together. Right. I think we had maybe one rehearsal and then lockdown happened. And then lockdown so, happened. Yeah, so we were together and we were kind of like, you know, on, on the cusp of it, but then we'd have to wait every few months for people to be allowed out again. And we ended up basically rehearsing the same song for half a year because we'd Great. rehearse, then 
be locked away for, for however long and then come back out and then do the same thing. But yeah, and in the end, it was kind of a blessing because we had so much time to rehearse that by the time we did play live, it was very polished, which was great but it was really frustrating at the time um how did it go down with your band in particular when it's georgia and lizzie and aurora and emily and you got five smart strong people in a room that are very creative but somehow you manage for it all to come together and sound so cohesive was there ever a meeting like hey our egos have to be taken out of this we just got to do what's best for the song how did it work for the last dinner party there was never a meeting i think it was just i think i don't really know i think it's really kind of lucky and magical maybe it's because we started when we were all in our early to mid 20s and i think if we'd started maybe when we were all teenagers it would be harder to navigate but because everyone you know i'm i'm only the youngest by like a couple of months and i think everyone was already kind of secure in themselves and kind of was coming at the project from a place of love and excitement and like no one really has a big ego everyone's you know everyone's confident and secure and has self doubt and you know all kinds of fluctuating you know levels of, of how much you believe in yourself but i think what's great is we all really respect each other and i feel like none of us think at least i hope not <laughs> none of us think that one person is better than everyone else or is contributing more it's really kind of what are those machines called where like, i don't know but like a very a, a good machine where where it can't work unless everyone's moving together you know and we all talk as well we we have meetings and if someone's feeling you know stressed or worried about something we talk about it and it's kind of you know i we've never had the cliche of being in a band where everyone hates each other and we need separate dressing rooms but you know it's only been it's only been three years so maybe <laughs> maybe in the future but it sounds like with all the words that you just used like not only have you already done it? But you're on your way just getting bigger by the day. And whenever I play your music on the radio, always to my DMs on Instagram, Striker, who is that group you just played? Who was that? What's what? What's their story? And I, the last dinner party, you got to see them live when they come back to LA or wherever my show is broadcast from. So thanks, uh, thanks for hyping us up. Yeah, of course. It's just, I mean, I was so blown away from that first show that I was lucky enough to go see. So why did you guys decide to do some cover songs and release uh, some acoustic versions of your songs? Can you just let me know how that all played out for the release coming up in October? I mean, honestly, it's the same reason why we started doing covers in our shows because we really like it it was really fun and i think we had to figure out how to transfer the songs into acoustic format for a lot of american radio stations because that's like you know the popular format and i remember when we started doing it, i think especially for me my favorite one to start doing was caesar on a tv screen it was just really fun and cool for us to kind of strip it back because most of all the songs most of them all started as acoustics like on piano or guitar and it just kind of it's rewarding to strip them back and play them, you know, acoustically because it gives it a different emotion, but it doesn't take away anything from the song. And then for the covers, it's it's honestly just fun for us. And I feel like, you know, we've got good responses from the fans when we when we played them. We played Wicked Game a lot on our last American tour and that went down really well. Yeah. And this town ain't big enough. Uh, spark. Some sparks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then up north as well, which is cover that we lit which lizzie sings which we only played like once live but it was such a gorgeous cover that really meant a lot to them and we're now going to be doing it live again hopefully it's just honestly it's just because we want if we wanted to it's fun um <laughs> great answer right there but someone yeah. else likes it that's cool <laughs> Right. Exactly. Those guys from Sparks, uh, Ron and Russell, they actually went to my high school before I did. And so that's like my like point uh, five percent claim to fame. So when I see someone mention Sparks and you're covering them, I, I get very excited about that. Yeah. So Russell came to our, our last show on the last UK tour, US tour in America. Um, and we didn't know that he was there because there was kind of like whispering of like maybe maybe Ron and Russell will come, we don't know. And then I think I said to our manager, like, I don't want to know if they're here because that's too much pressure. <laughs> and then we were backstage after the show and our manager was like, oh, we have a surprise. And then Russell just came down. And I thought, oh God, because I I introduced the song because I thought, of course, they're not there. They're not going to be here. Right. And 
I said something like, and now we're going to do a cover by by two divas. <laughs> from and then he was like, I was like, oh shit, I just called you. Like, he liked it. I feel like it's a compliment to be a diva. I don't know. Um, but yeah, he, he, they, he was really lovely. That was nice to feel like, you know, we haven't butchered it, maybe. Yeah. I saw that Ed Sheeran jumped on stage with of all bands, The Offspring, and played with them. And then he showed The Offspring that he had a tattoo of that band. I actually saw Youngblood also on stage with that band. But if you were at a festival, you're with your band. Is there a group out there that said, Abigail, come and sing a song with us on stage. We want you to join us. Who would that band be from any genre? Does it have to be a band? No, it can be an individual artist. It would have to either be Chapel Roan or Nick Cave. <laughs> okay. That would be, that would be my, my two picks. <laughs> These are two incredible answers. Someone super young, someone who was like Hall of Fame status and mm -hmm. both mysterious and super smart. Yep. My fingers are crossed. Oh, I like them. <laughs> Can you put in a good word for me if you ever see them around? Yes. yes, for sure. I will put in the best of words for you, okay? A question about James Ford, who produced your album. And for those that don't know James Ford, what a producer, everything from like Arctic Monkeys, Gorillas. Uh, Fontaines at, at DC uh, and many more. Was it at all nerve wracking or difficult to use your voice to speak up on how you wanted things if you didn't think a sound was going the way that you heard it in your own ears? Not at all. It was one of the best experiences we've ever had with anyone in the industry, I think. And we're working with him. We're going to work on him with, on the second record as well, which is really, really wonderful. And I've said this before and I'll say it again many, many times we working with him was just such a gift he is one of the most generous men i think in music because you know it's it's a lot to be a producer that has such a lot under your belt you know he's done everyone like you said you know and i think it would be easy you know if, and we were nervous at first at first before we met him um and before we went in because we this was so early on you know we'd just been signed and it was a few months later that we went in and we didn't really we still weren't 100 percent sure of ourselves we weren't quite sure and we were really nervous to go in and immediately he made us feel like we deserved to be there and not just like we deserved to be there and we were so lucky but that we knew what we were doing and I think that's such a gift to give to a young band and especially a young band of, you know, non-male artists who are just starting out and are being put with this really prolific, prestigious producer. And he just had no, no ego, no James Ford stamp he wanted to, you know, put on. He just wanted to help us make the best record. And he did. And it was really, it really made us... It did a lot for our confidence, you know, to be in a room with someone that you really respect and look up to who, who you know, says, yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? And it's a small thing, but it's, you know, it, it, it does a lot for your confidence to be told, you, you know what you're doing. The songs are good. Just keep going. Um, and that was such, such a gift. That is so cool to hear. Was there ever a point where, and this is not a negative thing in my mind, where anyone in your family or in your circle, when you're like, yep, we're starting a band and we're going to do this thing. Did anyone say, well, maybe focus on school for a little bit? How did how did it play out for you? Well, we were all kind of towards the end of our uni kind of things. So it was sort of, you know, all right, we weren't really worrying parents too much. Okay. But I think I've been, I feel like, you know, I've been telling my mom that I've wanted to do this since I was a kid. So I don't think it really surprised her. I think, you know, when I was, before I went to uni, you know, I wanted to go to music school or, or drama school. My my parents said, no, you, you know, don't do that. Do do something, you know, maybe academics, you can get a, a real job. But, you know, I think we just took it really seriously the whole time. And so everyone around us kind of took it seriously and believed in us and believed in the music, which is really lucky. You know, if anyone had doubts, they weren't telling us to stop. <laughs> How many shows approximately do you, do you think the last dinner party did before there was some noise about the group? Hey, there's something going on here and maybe a record label or management from around the world. It kind of maybe either sent you a message or just showed up at your shows. Wasn't many. It was maybe Well, the 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 fourth show that we played um was filmed by a man called Lou Smith who is this incredible man who 
you know, goes around venues in London, mainly London, and films every day of the week, you know, new bands that are coming up just because he loves it so much and he's so passionate about music and he filmed our gig um, and put it on YouTube. And that was the video that got all the attention from record labels. So it was really quick, honestly. And then it might have been something like 10 or 12 before we got signed. I don't know. Like it was very quick uh, once once the word got out. Well, listen, I cannot thank you enough for jumping on my old Tune on Toast podcast here. And it's also a radio show. And I'm going to play a bunch of your music. And I have been playing your music. Thanks for inspiring a dude like me. I'm rooting for you guys. I have been and I will continue to do so. Congrats on everything. Thank you so much. It's so nice to hear. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. I will see you very soon, I hope. Thank you again. See you in LA. <laughs> see you in LA. Okay, Thank take you. care. Bye. 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 Hope you enjoyed. Now hit that subscribe button. And for more Tuna on Toast, listen wherever you get your podcasts.